digital life link. We're here at MP St. Thomas Aquinas Hall on another beautiful snowy Sunday. Hopefully this will uh, appear online and you can listen to the talks. So this is a talk from the life link called Triple Take. Um, yeah. So we're going to now make the switch in our life semester from Old Testament, which is basically you got the first half of Christmas, and now we're going to do New Testament for three weeks. Uh, this week, Triple Take, we'll do next week, John, John's Gospel, I Am, and then we'll end with a little bit of St. Paul uh, in the year of St. Paul and his letters. So, so we're going to talk about the Gospels. Now, if you, I was going to ask the teens here how many Gospels there are, but there are four. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We separate them between John, which is a very theological document, and then the other three, which is Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They call them the synoptic gospels, which basically is a big fancy word for being similar. Now, the really cool thing about these is that they don't match up. They don't really match up perfectly. So there's some stories that are in Mark's gospel that are in Matthew's, some that are in John or in Luke's that aren't in in, uh, in Mark's, and so on and so forth, all the way through. There are lots that are all three are the same, and then, anyways. This is kind of like, you know, I don't know. See, none of the teens to be applicable to because you guys are all angels. But when I was a teen, and my brother and I, or my, my friends and I would do something wrong, not to be kidding, but when we would do something wrong, we would kind of, you know, get together and make sure our stories were exactly the same, so that our parents would, we'd have an airtight alibi. Anyway, so that's why it doesn't apply. I mean, you guys are all angels, and not invited to replace you. But, Anyways, so the stories don't really match up, and that's a better way to tell if they're very truthful. If they're based on them. So what I'm going to do is going to go through them the way they appear in the Bible. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and I'm going to just kind of talk about how they are, and yeah, uh, we're, going to, we're going to kind of go through how those Gospels work. So here we go. Um, let's start with Matthew. Matthew is one of my personal favorite Gospels, and I'm kind of law-oriented, and so is Matthew. Matthew is a tax collector named Levi Matthew. And he was, this is the most despised profession in the old world. He was a, a Jew who basically worked for the government and collected money on their behalf. And then to make, to make his money, he collected a little bit more. And some of the tax collectors would be really crooked and it's like disgusting when it's extra money. Uh, he was literally the lowest of the law. Matthew was called from his position in his tax collecting by Jesus. And he had what we call a transformational moment. He literally let go of the money, the thing that had basically gripped him his whole life, left, let it go, and walked away. So much so to the point that he completely wiped himself clean of the money. Like, he was not the person in charge of the common purse for the apostles. That was Judas. So he didn't want to give away the money. He didn't want to have anything to do with money anyway. Now, uh, Matthew also has this wonderful story of tax collector who was converted as well, which is Zacchaeus. He was the guy, little short guy who was on the tree, and then Jesus said to live in, I want to go to your house, and he gave away half his stuff. So Matthew really liked conversion exponents. Now he was a devout Jew, and so he followed the law. And his whole gospel was designed towards a Jewish audience, which was probably written uh, somewhere between five and 30 years after Jesus' death. And it would make sense to be the first one that, that because it was mainly Jesus original target audience was the Jews and uh, expanding from them. Anyways, Matthew really tries to make the case that Jesus is the Messiah, which is very important to the, Jew, to the Jewish culture and you know, makes the case for Christ. Uh, so Matthew, that's why the whole genealogy is in Matthew's gospel and the proof that he is you know, the thing that the Jews have been waiting for for thousands and thousands of years. It also connects him back to the great historic, biblical historical characters like Abraham and David. So it, that becomes really important to them. It also has a lot of about two old chapters on the Sermon on the Mount, which by the way, is one of the most important reads you can read if you've never read the Sermon on the Mount in its entirety. Chapter five, six, and seven of Matthew's Gospel takes about 15 minutes and is still relevant to us almost 2,000, over 2,000 years later. Um, he also, Matthew's also the guy that has all those Old Testament references. And he spends a lot of time talking about the, the gift the replacement of the new covenant, which is, the new covenant is Jesus himself, and available to all of us at the Last Supper, which we celebrate in the sacrament of the Eucharist. Uh, and he extent makes a case for Jews and for all Christians in chapter 28, the end of his gospel, that we are to go forth with disciples of all nations, baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. He's really saying that, yes, Jesus is the Messiah. He is the guy. 
But not only now he isn't just saying that he's the Jewish Messiah, he's saying that he's the Messiah of the world. And it is our responsibility as people who know the Old Testament to share this good news with the, with the Gentiles and the people. So Matthew is that guy. 